Welcome back to our Preschool All-Stars podcast. I'm here with my good friend, Sally Hoy, the creator of Fairy Dust Teaching. Now she also has done the free to play summit as you've probably already participated in. She did that last year and we absolutely loved joining her on her summit. Today, we're going to talk about all the pain points though, about having a play-based education with our preschoolers. You know, do we do worksheets? Uh, that is the, you know, the word <laughs> of the day sometimes, uh, whether we involve worksheets or how do we really incorporate play into our day-to-day activities with our preschoolers. So welcome to the podcast, Sally. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Me too. So let's dive right in. Now, last time we talked, we talked a lot about your, um, your summit that you did and the community you build around it. And I'm super excited to talk a little bit later in the podcast about something new that you're creating. But before we get there, let's dive into the root of play-based learning. Tell me your, you have so much experience. Can you kind of give our listeners this roundup? Cause I saw you a year ago. So tell us where you've been since a year, what you've been working on and how you got involved in the play-based uh, learning space. Yeah. So I, I'll tell you what really has made me a, um, not just an advocate, but a wild haired advocate is the neuroscience behind play-based education. And, you know, I'll touch on that in a minute, but I think one of the biggest challenges of being play-based is that we live in a world that has a certain system of education and as Seth Godin calls it the factory model, right? Where children come in as empty little vessels and we're in the lineup, filling them full of the information they need and on down the conveyor belt, they go to the next, you know, place. And if they don't get the information we're putting in, they have to be reprocessed. And Seth Godin also brings out the first person I've ever heard really nail this is that then the parents are also involved in this process because they're, uh, what's the word status ego is based on is their child succeeding in that system it's a reflection you know if not they're called in um so here we have parent teacher child all with no voice and with this mandated indoctrinated feed their their empty brains so when you come in with play-based education There's not a lot of understanding nor listening for it because we're all subconsciously and have been through the other system. And so, you know, where are the ABCs? Where are the colors? Where are the shapes? Where are the worksheets? Where are the, you know, this is education. This is what we know is education. What's interesting is that this form of education for young children is, is, um, I, I, I wouldn't want to, I'm really careful here because I want to give respect, right? Because there are some children who, I had one, who loved worksheets. You know? <laughs> and we're not going to stop that, right? Like if the child, if that's what they're going for, they love it. Yes, let's do it. But that there's more to education than that. There's more to bring into the, into the realm of what we do to prepare children for academic learning in first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and on up. And what's interesting is the neuroscience behind play. If if we could give them like the matrix, the right pill to eat so they could see it. It's like, like there's no denying play is the way to prepare a child for academic learning. And one more thing, you see, you get me going, I can't stop. I love it. (laughs) The next thing that I think is really crucial about play-based education is not all play-based education is equal. So, you know, play-based education is for me, I have to tip my hat and give regards to Reggio Emilia as really the way shower, as well as Waldorf education has some really spectacular and Montessori have spectacular, but what Reggio Emilia did is it showed us how we can, as researchers, really drive the learning happening, not by interfering, by by supporting. And that's where it gets really like mind blowing. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. I saw, um, I saw 
one of teacher Tom's beautiful Mm -hmm. blog posts. And he said, Mm -hmm. as teachers, a lot of times we get in this control mindset, right. Where we're like, okay, so, you know, I'm teacher, right. And I'm going to control. He said, don't control the child, control the environment that Mm -hmm. the child is put into. Right. So you can lay out everything. You create those opportunities to play and then see where the child is taking and how you can continue to facilitate their play. Like, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah. And I think the thing that's really important here is, you know, control, the mindset of control again, comes from the educational system we yes. all were raised in. Right. <laughs> right. Because that's the marker of a good teacher. Yes. You know, like I, I worked in public school most of my career, at least a decade in public school in four-year-olds in kindergarten. And, you know, you hear, oh, she's such a great teacher. The class is quiet. You could hear a pin drop, you know, like, you know, there's this whole thing about, so I think it's even deeper than that. I think Mm. it's, it's, it's one thing to say, you know, we're not controlling the children. We're, we're putting control in the environment. It's subconscious. So I think it's really getting clear. Like I remember so well standing in my kindergarten class and, uh, you know, I'm with nine other educators who are conventional, who are, you know, mainstream worksheet factories, right? Mm -hmm. Amazing teachers, by the way. Um, You know, I think we have to be really compassionate with our our other educators because amazing teachers are inside of those classrooms. And I'm going to say something that I think is crucial that with my children, I think the state of the educator is more important than any methodology. Ah, oh, it's beautiful. I'm going to say that again, because I want to make it really clear my stand. I'm into play-based education, but if I had the choice of a educator who was hyper-focused on everything in the environment being perfect and the children, you know, really, you know, you know, wound up about it. You're right. <laughs> a, a, a worksheet mill teacher who loved the children, mm. loved my child, did everything they could to have them feel loved and supported. That's the teacher I'm going to choose. Yeah. So I think we have to remember at the end of the day, if you remember your own educators in your life, it's the ones that loved us and supported us and mm. wanted the best for us. Yeah. I mean, love wins at the end. <laughs> Yes, it trumps everything, <laughs> you know, and I, I, I don't know, I think in all of the, you know, like there's some really fierce debates on things and I, I, I just don't want to step over yeah. that there's educators doing worksheets because that's what they were raised in. They're coming from that indoctrination. They believe they're doing the best and they're giving their heart and soul to it. They just haven't seen what I've seen. Right. I am not going to diminish the power of who they are for children. I love that. I'm never going to do that. It's because I'm a, like, this is my spiritual path. Education is a spiritual journey for me. Mm-hmm. And so when I look at it from that perspective, it, it, again, it goes back to this is, I say, education begins in the heart and soul of the educator. We are the environment. We are the climate. We are the community. We, we, right? Yes. Everything else is secondary. And I think too, because some people might be listening to, you know, my comment about the environment thing and saying, well, I don't have this. I don't have that. I can't bring in this or that. I, you know, I have limited resources and I love what you just mentioned was start here with your heart. Right. And when that comes through, you can do wonders and miracles with almost nothing. Right. Right. That's it. It's the only, it is the starting place. Mm. In fact, I have a certification program and that's, that's all we do for a year is dive into the heart of the matter because no method. It's kind of like when you're, we have, I think being indoctrinated inside of a system. And like I said, I experienced it standing there looking you know, my class being a little bit of a higher hum than the other classes <laughs> and me looking around feeling like, like really feeling panicked and having my stomach tie up in knots and going, mm. why am I so, so nervous? And, you know, and I really got to feel it viscerally, what it means to be 
pressured by society's expectations because that's what they grew up with. And I can't make people wrong for what they grew up thinking was right, right? Like my job is to educate and to transform society. That's my spiritual mission. One, one human at a time. Yes. But, but you know, what, what you really get is at the end of the day, like you said, it's what matters is who we are for the children and the honor and respect that we bring for them. Mm. And it kind of goes into, I know I wanted to talk to you about how community is so important to me. Be, and I'm really like catapulting my own uh, business into community because I think when you're in the midst of it, like when I was in the classroom, just going, why is it I want to shut them down and make them quiet? <sighs> why is it I'm terrified that they're going to go into first grade, not knowing what the other classrooms have taught, because I haven't done the same processes, like all of that, that angst that we get that, you know, to have someone to, to, to comfort you or for you to put a question out and get it answered by the community. We need each other because we're standing outside of the norm. I think too, like you haven't seen everything. And so your limited experience, and if we're coming in new to this play-based um, environment, man, like we will struggle to trust the process, right? Because we've been conditioned. And so when right. you open up your, your, your community to a wider variety of people who have been there, done that they're 10 years into it, they're 20 years, oh, they've seen that totally. child go from preschool and graduated and flourish we can put our trust in other people, but when we're siloed, it's really hard because then you're struck, then your community is the people who are, uh, nope, it's, it's everything that I tell you to do because this is what has always been done. Right. So we have exactly. to expand our horizons. We do. And I think that there's, there's such a richness in, in even the beginner's voice who, you know, it's like, all voices have such power because again, sometimes I hear people who are brand new to the play-based way and it's exquisite what they bring up and what they're struggling with because, you know, I, I forgot what it means to be a beginner. I forget sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I, the other thing I would put in that I have done, so I have auditory dyslexia. Mm -hmm. And so I, like, there are like, <laughs> I want to do a podcast, right? I hesitate because I know 90% of the names I'm going to mangle, you know, it's like, <laughs> because you can show me, you can tell me. I remember I had this interview for one of my conferences with this woman from Italy and she told me how to pronounce the name. I wrote it down phonetically and I still mispronounced it. You know, it's <laughs> like, it's, it's, a, it's when you have a disability, mm. it's real, right? Yep. So going into play-based, I struggled with one, I had mandates and, and benchmarks and all of this of being in the public school, which is insanity, especially with four-year-old spending a three hours assessing each child, you know, not so, <laughs> not so wise at the first days of school, you yes. know, they need you, they need to connect right. you. Yeah. But what I did was what I began to deconstruct. So this is what I do for my own understanding. What does it mean for a child to go into play to the place where it's really preparing them for school, like self-initiated, self-selected, self-directed, self but supported by the teacher. So what am I doing on the other side? So I created a, a map called play activated learning that shows what the child's doing, shows what the educator's doing. And I've built, I, in fact, we're building it now, getting it ready a yes. brand new wonder led um, membership that literally educates people in that model. Mm. So they can master understanding each phase of the process, understanding what's happening with the child and what they're, they're observing. And then what's happening with you, what's the best way you can give. Cause I think at the end of the day, when you have a play-based educator who starts pulling out traditional methods it's just want to make, you just want to make sure the child's ready. Right. Right. You know? <laughs> like, have I, what if they're not ready? What if I failed them? Like, I yeah. think we all like, it's always best intent. Mm. 
And so if people understand exactly the, what's happening and know what to do, know the skills required, know the capacities required, then confidence can rise. Then speaking with confidence with parents is like my superpower. And I'm really grateful I had it because I couldn't have survived in the settings I was in without that to really assure them and to explain the brain science and to give them that understanding of what's happening with their child. And I think they need those words to use. I mean, if someone was in front of me and I'm trying to explain, you know, why I'm homeschooling my kids and well, what's the plan and what curriculum are you using? I'm, I'm not, we're not, we're just doing our thing. Right. I don't have the words to use. Um, and so I think being in a community and being going through these modules that you've created and, and having the guidance and here's what to say to a parent or to a fellow teacher or to your administrator, when they question what's going on in your classroom, here's like you said, here's the science behind it. And here's how this is going to progress. And, and I think also you mentioned a really key point, which was, you talked about, um, the person growing into their own experience and finding like the joy in that, because when you, when you dive back into the heart and the joy of it all, like you'll go on forever, as long as you're still feeling happy about it. Right. Like if it's lighting you up inside, not only are you going to yes. keep light up, but you're going to keep doing it. And this is so key. So one of the, again, the major shift I've had in the last year, I think the pandemic really upheavaled my insides, you know, like it really caused me to, to deepen my integrity, you know, like to deepen the work that I'm providing that I'm truly making a difference. And so I think one of the things that really stands so poignant to me, especially as people are going online and having to do Zoom and we're really breaking down over that, is that again, it all starts with our own sense of well being and confidence. That, you know, no method, no strategy, no inspirational blog post, no great, you know, podcast episode, except maybe yours, <laughs> <laughs> are going to move the needle without the inner work. Yep. And, and if you think about um, intent, so when you're with someone who has ill intent or you're with someone who has no, no, like feels uncertain and confused and even scared, hmm. it's their body reveals the truth. Their body reveals the truth. So if we're trying to you know, tell parents something that we've read in an article, but we don't really know if we believe it, they right. can feel the authenticity of it. If we're standing there terrified, they're going to push back. They can feel our terror. Yes. So I think that's why the inner work is so important. And that the map that I created is not specific to any one methodology, because I don't feel it's my place to say my way is the, the best way. Like, I'm never going to say that. And I really invite people when they come into my work to use what resonates as true for you and throw the rest away. Yeah. I'm one voice. I'm just one voice. And we need to begin to honor each other's differences. And that maybe someone is half, you know, traditional, half play-based. Yes, I'm going to stand up with you and mm -hmm. cheer you on. You know, I was in circumstances where I only had two hours a day of play, of true play. You know, it's so much better than none. Yes. You know, yeah. <laughs> Before we talk about the Wonder League, which I am so excited, you have completely, you know, just gone above and beyond with what you're doing right now with it. Before we touch on that in just a second. Could you speak to one thing? And I think this has been on my heart and especially circling back a year now, um, yeah. a year from now, since we talked last time, could we talk about the two years since COVID and how everyone, I, I would be so great to have words to say because everybody, you know, in the system is explaining how, oh my gosh, everybody's coming in. They're at a two-year deficit. You know, these, uh, you know, these kindergartners are acting like three to four-year-olds or even toddlers sometimes, uh, they don't know how to do X, Y, Z. And, 
you know, they are really speaking to how in the world will they ever catch up? Now you have a completely different philosophy of forget those standards. They, when we do play-based kids learn at the rate they need to, what would you say to, to those people, which I still love them because they're still, you know what I'm saying? They're still our people, but I'm just saying like, how, how could we talk about that? Again, if you're coming from, um, and again, I just highly recommend anyone who's interested in the the idea of the factory model to look up Seth Godin, Mm -hmm. masterfully put. Um, But I think if you're coming from that perspective, then there is an alarm to look at, right? Because that's a very closed system and a very a very unnatural expectation of every child at this age is going to accomplish these things. And if they don't, then we have to put them in special classes at et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, you know, coming from that lens, one's going to raise a red flag. But I think again, the pandemic really brought home to me the importance of honoring our limbic systems, (laughs) right? That, that we in learning happens from engagement in the emotional system. And they, you know, we say the limbic system is the light switch of learning. So, you know, I know I have trauma from the pandemic I'm Mm -hmm. still working through. And children have trauma from, we all have trauma. Yes. Now, if you knew your beloved grandmother had been through a traumatic event and she sat down in your living room, would you go, we need to do something with grandma. She's not <laughs> talking to us like she used to. I think we need to get, you know, like red yeah. flags. No, you're going to go, what does grandma need? Mm. Our love. Time, and grace. Yeah. And grace. And so I think with children, I know I've heard the stories. Children are coming in in all sorts of conditions. And what they need is love. That's why I'm standing. That is my battle cry. Mm -hmm. Love yourself. Let down the expect. Give yourself grace. Mm -hmm. You know, stand, you know, use metaphors that people can understand. Like, you know, everyone loves, most people love their grandma. They understand we're not going to beat grandma up or put her in special classes because she's not communicating or as active as she used to be. We're going to give her love and like you said, grace Mm -hmm. and look at what is it that we can all like let go and relax. And, you know, it it really takes that slowing it down, giving children two years to, you know, unpack that wild experience. Mm -hmm. Like, we, you know, I think sometimes we want to be one and done that we want a strategy, a method and make it go away. No, we're human beings. Children are human beings. It's like, are you over it yet? Are you past the trauma? Then why do you right. think children would be? Yeah. They're full human. That's again, Reggie Amelia, full human beings. Now treat them like human beings. Would you do that to your grandmother? Would you do that to your best friend? Don't do it mm-hmm. to the children in your class. So, you know, they've lost the ability to potty. Bring, you know, and again, I think intent is felt with children have that spidey sense to go, it's okay. You know, we're here, we're we're going to move through this. Mm -hmm. I loved what you said. You said, look at them and ask yourself, what do they need? When you bring it down to that level, Sally, Mm -hmm. like everything else melts away. Like that just gives me chills. What look at that child's eyes. And as long as you're asking that question with love and with grace, what does that child need from me? How can I help this child exact meet them where they're at? Forget the standards. How do we help them with where they're at and what they need right now? Nothing else matters. It's what that child needs right then. If you look at, and I think most teachers are in it because of our pay level, because it's a mission, it's Mm -hmm. a spiritual path. Mm -hmm. And so looking at being, you know, for lack of better words, spiritual midwives in this trauma that we we really take on this, this stance of, I'm going to serve what needs to be served now. I'm Mm -hmm. not going to listen to the machine yelling at me, you know, no, that makes no sense. You know, how many people still haven't returned to the office? Yeah. Like there, it's so global. 
And I think when we look at our educational system, it doesn't even necessarily set people up for success. Like myself, I was a failure in the school system. I literally entered a university uh, that my father was the vice president at, right? They brought me into admissions, sat me down and looked at me and said, the only reason we're letting you in is that your father works here. You don't have the grade point or the scores. That was me. I didn't think I was smart because of my dyslexia. Like I took biology. I couldn't do biology. I couldn't sort out all the words that looked the same. Right. You know, like it was, it would make me cry. And yet the lack of, of finesse in the educational system didn't stop me from having the life I love. Mm -hmm. Like I have a life I love an extraordinary life. So I think we have to stop making the educational system and accomplishment the end all be all. You know, you look at so many people out there who've achieved like, you know, Elon Musk, like major names in the industries out there who, who didn't do well in the system. Mm -hmm. And maybe because we weren't indoctrinated, we had the freedom to fly. Maybe the educational system isn't necessarily the best choice. So if your child's falling behind, praise God. <laughs> That's what <laughs> I Your say. eyes are open, you know, yeah. to some flaws. Yeah. It's so much more than that. You know, my own son didn't start reading until further down the road. But, you know, I think it comes back to in education, the markers that mean the most for a, a literate, educated human being mm -hmm. is oral language. Yep. Oral language. It all falls down to that. That is the, that, if you want to know the academic benefit of any method is oral language, children mm -hmm. talking. Mm -hmm. So, you know, talk to the children about their experience, you know, about what they're going through, support them, be in communication with them, love them. That is beautiful. Sally, you, oh, I love speaking with you. This is always <laughs> like it in it invigorates me to like do more, be better, just like oh. go spend time with my kids right now. Like, I just love this. So oh, thank you. I love it too. Tell love us about you. the wonder league. You have really just dived into this. You had it before, but you have revamped it. And I, based on your passion, you were talking about it before I can feel the passion you have for this. So tell us what is the wonder league? Tell us about this community. How can we learn more yeah. about play-based learning? So the Wonder League was really like, the way I had it before was like Netflix. I had all of my trainings in it, which are were hundreds of hours, mm -hmm. like even my oldest ones that I wanted to delete, but I have people in the Wonder League <laughs> who've been with me since 2010. They won't let me delete it. You right. know, like, but, you know, and then we'd have Zoom calls. And what I was feeling like when the pandemic first hit that in 2020, we had a lot of people online with us. Mm -hmm. But then I saw the exhaustion of online and the avoidance of it, including yeah. myself. You know, it's like another Zoom meeting. No, I don't want one. So <laughs> I really began to dig in and look because I am passionate about learning in the science of learning. I'm passionate about community. So I began to really see that we have to do more than just provide training. So I have built this in this platform, um, all of this pathway towards this pyramid pathway that I have of understanding play-based education. So there's all these trainings that support that. Mm -hmm. Then all, all extra courses under each of those pathways, like underneath observation, I have deep play that gives you the full science behind play, you know, things like that, you know, I have a course called the play training that teaches you how to speak the brain science, I actually train you to speak it, not just tell you it, I train you, you know, I have parent downloads, things like that. But with each training, you can actually talk to people inside of the training. You can go, we have areas where you can go ask for help. We have areas where you can go into a director's lounge, you can go into infant toddler lounge so that it's literally anything you need, we have your back. Mm. 
and that you're not alone. I have a full-time staff member in charge of taking care of people yeah. and getting them what they need, whether it's me or another team member, a resource, whatever it is. Yeah. Super excited. I'm so excited too, because it comes from you. And that's like something core to me. When I feel the passion from you, when I feel like this immense, like you said, like this is a spiritual journey for you. Like this is your mm -hmm. calling in life. And when I feel that from somebody, like I want to get behind it as best as I can, right? Like I want to propel you forward because you're inspiring people everywhere. So how can everyone join the Wonder League? So I will give you a link that they can click. And I have this epic sales page, information page. I like to call them information page yes. because I think, because it really tells you everything about what's inside of it, our stand, what, what problems we're addressing. And we only open once a year. And so I, if you're interested, I highly recommend that you sign up and you can cancel at any time. There is, there is no commitment here. You can come in for, you know, it's $25 a month. You can come in for $25, experience it, download stuff and bail out. You know, <laughs> <laughs> one of the things we have for all of the tire kickers out there that is worth coming in, downloading, and if that's your methodology, <laughs> but it is we have play invitations mm -hmm. and those play invitations we do. Um, I have two staff members that develop this for us. And this came out of the pandemic again, just honoring teachers who are stressed out and in trauma may not be on their full game and that's okay. So we have, you know, these big overarching big idea packs, like it might be all about structure. And it has play invitations around structure for the educator. We also have a pack that you send home to the parents for at home oh, that's activities. Yes. And then we have done for you lesson plans. That's because amazing. It, yeah. Cause I just, you know, and we had it as a separate prod, uh, product, but I, if for some reason, like I always listen to my gut, like on it's mission first profit second. Mm -hmm. And I, didn't publicly advertise it, but we had probably like 200 people just find the link and sign up. You know? yeah. <laughs> it's like, what do you want and I just felt like, again, it was in isolation. So I rolled it into the Wonder League. So now that's the only place you can get it. And mm -hmm. each month we issue a new one. So we have like, I think 12 boxes. We call them Wonder Boxes. Yes. Already in the Wonder League and, and new ones coming every month. Everyone needs to go join the Wonder League right now. Click the link in the description or in the email I just sent you so that you can go ahead and join with Sally and be inspired to bring back play as the foundation of your teaching. Sally, thank you again for being with us. Thank you. I always enjoy talking to you. It's amazing. If you love today's episode, then you are going to love this. I want to give you a free gift in your hands. This is a copy of my book, Start Your Preschool, and I want to get it to you for free. Yes, I said for free. It is a 300 page book. It'll help you learn the step by step process to actually starting your local or your online preschool. Every single step that I walked myself through, as well as the thousands of women who've created their own successful preschools have gone through the exact steps listed in this book. Not to mention, I also share 20 amazing women's stories. So as you can see how not only did it work for me, but it works for amazing women just like you as well. I want to get you this free copy. Just go to freepreschoolbook.com or click the link in the description and we'll get it to you today. Again, just go to freepreschoolbook.com and we'll get it right to you.